Welcome to everybody joining us today. It's great to see so many attendees. I think we have something like over 400 people registered. So as you all file in, um, I will go through some, some housekeeping. But it really is so great to see so much interest. And I think it really shows the commitment of those working in the built environment to address the climate emergency, which is really fantastic. So my name is Sarah Lewis. I'm Research and Policy Director at the UK Passive House Trust, and I am delighted to be joining today by Mark Siddle and Daniel Dyer. So our first speaker today is Mark Siddle. We're really lucky to have Mark with us today as he is one of the pioneers that brought Passive House to UK shores and he's one of the most experienced Passive House architects in the northeast of England, so a really great resource for us today. For those who do not yet know Mark, um, I'm sure some of you will, um, he is Director of the Architecture and Research um, at Durham based LEAP, which is the Lovingly Engineered Architecture Practice. He is a champion of best practice and the REBA 2030 Challenge, which you'll be talking about today. He's also co-chair of REBA's Northeast Sustainability Futures Forum, a trustee of the Association for Environmentally Conscious Builders, which is the AACB, and a technical advisor to the Passive House Trust, where I personally really enjoy getting the benefit of his vast experience. Mark's going to be leading us through an introduction to the Passive House standard within the context of that 2030 REBA challenge. He's also going to set out the need for a new REBA plan of work overlay for Passive House services. This is a developing piece of work that we um, at the Trust, REBA and Mark are all working on together and it's really great to have the opportunity today for Mark to give us all a high level of, re uh, sort of review of where the overlay is at the moment um, and then in the Q&A session we're keen to get people's questions and comments specifically relating to that document. So please do uh, pop your questions in as we go. Um, so I think that brings us to Mark. So over to you, Mark. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, just uh, give me a moment while I. Uh... OK, so uh, yes, the you know, passive house overlay is uh, kind of what we're leading towards today, but really what I'm going to do initially at least is set the context for passive house because I'm going to assume that most of you and most of the audience are not certified passive house designers at this particular point and this sets that you know this will help set the scene. Um, and then we'll be looking at, at the uh, overlay in its current state in a generalised form, just to look at the you know the basic frameworks that uh, it's going to be touching on. And we'd be very, as uh, Sarah mentioned, be very interested to hear your thoughts, your feedback in terms of what you would like the overlay to uh, contain and, and address. OK, so yeah, this is me and basically I've been involved with um, or had concerns about sustainable construction and building performance for um, you know well over a decade now. Um, but it really crystallised for me uh, when I became a dad and my parents became grandparents that you know, this uh, whole environmental future um, took a whole new spin. And um, so my my you know, the thoughts are let's uh, take on board uh, Greta's uh, thinking here and um, you're basically the underlying ethical imperative of if you're aware of a problem, then it's your responsibility to act. Or as Greta would say, you know, I want you to act as if your house is on fire because it is. Passive House, we're going to be going through the what, why and how. You know, basically, what are Passive House buildings? What is the Passive House standard? Because they are obviously two distinct things. Uh, why should we be thinking about uh, Passive House at all? Um, and how does it fit into the broader world? And then also, how can we go about delivering that? Which is where we lead into the discussion about the overlay and processes and things like that. OK, so what is a passive house building? Well, my take on it is, you know, we take the passive. It's basically not active. It's not requiring active participation. Things in the background just work and give you high standards of comfort, good indoor air quality, et cetera, without you requiring to um, do an awful lot of effort. Uh, so another way to think about that is it's automatic for one way of thinking about it. Um, simply because it doesn't require your active engagement. House, of course, we've got Kunst House, uh, which is art gallery. We've got Rat House, which is council chambers. Um, so, you know, a council building, you know, it's houses building. Um, and this is writ large when we say that you know, we've got residential properties on, on small scale, individual scale. We've got larger award, sterling award winning projects um, and uh, we've got schools. Uh, university laboratory buildings, we've got hospitals, leisure centres, archive buildings, offices, and we've also got retrofits of community centres and schools and, and, and other buildings as well. So 
there's a lot to go on here. Uh, the passive house standard can do it all in those respects. There are different ones whereby there are different levels of refinement to the um, standard uh, passive house kind of a criteria, shall we say? But you know, there are you know, there's a broad array of buildings. So the original thinking here uh, for a passive house building is that it refers to a building where thermal comfort, so you know, uh, it can be achieved solely by post heating or post cooling of fresh air which is required to achieve sufficient indoor air quality without the need for recirculation of the air. You know, so basically good indoor air quality uh, and comfort being kind of key principles here. And if we get that right, then we can do some good kind of uh, thoughtful design, which means we can strip out a lot of those, you know, the, the excessively sized services, fine tune things and reallocate that capital into the building fabric instead. The principle is simple. It basically works, you know, if the passive house building is working like a thermos flask. You're not needing to pump lots of heat in like you would to do um, to make your, um, you know, uh, your filter coffee here. Uh, basically, we're using a thermos flask. And the beauty of a thermos flask is that it doesn't just keep things warm, um, it can keep things cool as well. So therefore, if we put it into a building context, we're keeping buildings warm uh, in the winter and cool in the summer. So you can just as easily get your cold drink uh, out of uh, your thermos flask. So here we have a thermographic image of uh, some, some, well, a passive house building uh, writ large on the left. There's a little flare there. Someone's opened the window. That's not, a, that's fine. That's allowed. You know, you can get, a, you know, passive house buildings perform overall, and we'll come on to some of the performance issues a little bit later. Over up on the right hand side, you can, you've got your typical UK home, as it were, versus the uh, passive house uh, home on the lower left. Some continental examples. Um, so what is a passive house building? Now, really, this is an opportunity to start to dig into the standard and the criteria and, and some of the frameworks a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, playfully, it's that one of um, splitting light uh, in apart. And what if we dig in deep enough, as a certified passive house designer would do, then you'd actually recognise that there are around about 36 different criteria that are associated with passive house buildings. But we're not going to go into all of those right now. We're just going to look at some of the key headlines, thankfully. Um, yeah, there's a whole two week course on um, uh, becoming a certified passive house designer. So, uh, yeah, what is the passive house standard? Well, first of all, it's a global standard. You know, there's more than a million square meters of passive house buildings all the way around the world in various different climate zones. So there's never a reason that you to say that you can't do a climate zone in my area or in my locale or whatever that may be. You know, the physics doesn't change. Um, you know, physics is you know, universal in that respect. There are construction technologies, approaches that may differ, but they're localised and contextual. Um, so in terms of having a practical definition of a passive house, uh, the, the passive house standard itself, it's referring to the world's most effective quality assurance system for high performance buildings. You know, the standard utilises a scientifically tested and evidence based approach and third party certification is recommended. Buildings designed to this standard have been closed, uh, demonstrated to close performance gaps repeatedly in various different contexts from various different perspectives. Um, and this year, uh, the, pass, uh, the first passive house was built uh, in 1991 and it's now 30 years on. Um, there were some inter very interesting studies done 25 years on from the first project being built, uh, first, you know, which you can see here. The, um, and basically, the, you know, it came back with the confirmation that uh, all in all, it's performing as expected and no significant changes in performance. So the headline criteria break down uh, in some quite interesting and simple ways. Some of these things you may not normally be privy to um, because you're reading kind of headlines from newspapers or journals or something like that. Um, but total indoor environmental quality is absolutely critical in a passive house building. Um, in fact, that underlies everything that we're doing and leads to some of the performance criteria. So first of all, let's have, so let's dig into this in a bit more detail. Space heating demand is 15 kilowatt hours per meter square or 10 watts per meter square. Now, why is that? Why have I lumped that into part of your comfort criteria here? You know, total indoor environmental quality. And that's because there's an underlying assumption that um, the passive house buildings are generally heated to 20 degrees Celsius. Now, individual buildings in practice will be heat warmer or colder, uh, depending or cooler, I should say, depending on how people want to use their buildings themselves. A lot of performance measurements have shown that residential properties tend to be a couple of degrees warmer than that, and that, that's OK. You know, we, you know, the key thing is we've got performance tool and, we're, and evaluation process. So 10 watts per meter square on the coldest day of the year roughly turns into 15 kilowatt hours per meter square 
per annum over the course of the year for space heating demand. There's an air tightness target of 0.6 air changes per hour, which is about 16 times better than UK building regulations. There's summer comfort requirements that the bu a building should not exceed 25 degrees Celsius for more than 10% of the year, and less than 5% of the year being kind of considered uh, good practice. Um, and that means that, you know, with, you know, and we're also thinking about future climate issues as well in, in upcoming editions of uh, PHPP, which I'll come on to shortly. Indoor air quality, we're, you know, we're designing to provide 30 metres cubed of fresh air per person in uh, normal circumstances. And there's also noise criteria, which are completely ignored um, or unregulated by building regulations uh, standards, which means that, you know, Building regs, one in three people could be complaining about the noise from a ventilation system. Won't happen in the passive house because of the acoustic criteria that are set. We've got then in terms of looking at energy, we have uh, our primary energy uh, and P primary energy renewable. Now, basically, primary energy is basically if you've got a fossil fuel grid like we have right now. And then there's that future scenario whereby, whereby we have a renewable grid and there's issues associated with that. So there are different energy criteria associated with that. And th these things are tweaking and changing over time subtly. Um, but all in all, the core criteria do not change. In terms of datums, there is the passive house planning package. Uh, which is the tool which sets basically all the boundary conditions so that we can compare apples with apples. Um, with, there's also testing, blower door tests that have to be undertaken on every single pass certified passive house. And there's also commissioning of the ventilation systems to make sure that the air quality is going to be delivered in practice and that there's not an imbalance in the systems, again, something else which isn't regulated in the UK, um, which means that we uh, get the energy performance that we're expecting as well. If we move to away from new buildings to retrofits then there's the classic retrofit uh, which has a space heating demand target of 25 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum so that's somewhat more relaxed compared to new, the new build targets and there's the air tightness target which is also relaxed but one of the promote kind of the, the areas of, most, of greatest interest for retrofit is actually the component method now you'll see that the air tightness target has remained the same but the uh, space heat demand has changed yet again and that's because we're applying component based or element based uh, u values and things to existing bits of building fabric whilst also accommodating and addressing issues associated with thermal bridging and the likes um so uh, th there's a bit more flexibility and that suits various different uh, climate zones uh, around uh, the UK, climate areas. Yeah. Um, now, um, you know, so why the passive house standard? You know, now we've kind of got an understanding for indoor air quality and uh, thermal performance and, and the likes. Well, of course, you know, I think we're all here. We don't need to labour uh, the issues associated with the, cl uh, the climate crisis specifically. Um, but you know, it's a key kind of recognition here, as indeed is the uh, Ariba 2030 challenge and the trajectories that we're thinking about. So basically, if we're talking about buildings, you know, building projects today, then really we should be aiming for 2030 targets right now, simply because our projects take time to uh, design and progress the site and be constructed. And you know, the, the, other, the other important thing to recognise is that the Reba 2030 challenge is not about a theoretical design target. It's about as built measured performance. No performance gaps. What happens is what, you know, what you know, your target should be what happens in reality. And this means taking into account lots of subtle variables. Now, pass it, you know, so I'm not going to go into the finer details, but the key thing I'd like to flag here, that importantly, is that the REMA 2030 challenge is using some very valuable units in kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. OK. And, you know, and, uh, you know, in, and uh, the uh, RIBA have uh, recognised that Passive House is a solution that can help us address the REMA 2030 challenge. So basically, by targeting Passive House means we're not reinventing the wheel. The REBA 2030 challenge does a great job at saying this is how you should, you know, this is what you should be targeting, but it doesn't tell you how to get there. It doesn't give you a roadmap. It doesn't um, specify an approach that uh, with quality assurance behind it that will give you a building that will close those performance gaps in reality. So it, you know, and, you know, these clear targets do, don't change every few years. They're, you know, they're, for Passive House, they're well established and they've been going for over 30 years. Um, in terms of you know, those clear comfort criteria, which we've talked about for the you know, winter and summer and for air, health and well-being, relative humidity and the likes, it's clearly defined and verifiable. So you know, it's protect, protected under consumer law 
Um, so don't be talking about passive house principles and uh, misquoting yourself because I'll just bring your attention to the fact that building regulations principles involve insulation, air tightness, addressing thermal bridging and ventilation. All those things that some people try and flag up as being passive house principles because they're trying to get on um, a bit of a bandwagon to tell you the truth. Um, you know, what we have here is really everything is underwritten by quality assurance and that methodology and those processes, which Passive House certified des designers and certifiers truly understand. So it's mostly about performance, quality, comfort, uh, health and air quality. And it just happens that there's some very beneficial spin offs, which also tackle issues of energy use um, and uh, carbon emissions. And in the words of Jez Wingfield, formerly of uh, Leeds back at University Leeds Metropolitan University now of UCL, you know, until we get the processes right and have robust ways of verifying and checking performance, then the targets themselves become secondary. You know, there's no point having a target if you're not actually delivering in practice um, or in you know, those simple terms, you can't manage what you can't measure. So these are examples of projects that have been built, um, should we say at the moment, uh, you know, residential for sure, and dot and dab, uh, air leakage behind it, all sorts of cold drafts, elevated energy bills, um, just quite shoddy uh, from uh, my perspective. But if we uh, mistake proof our designs, pokey yoke, this is always my, you know, it's a Japanese term for mistake proofing. Um, so it's my reminder slide. If we mis want to mistake proof our designs, then how about Passive House? The, there's a peer reviewed paper that I had the honour of uh, contributing to with Wolfgang Feiss and, and Dr. David Johnston from Leeds Beckett University. Um, uh, so uh, we looked at 2000 newly built uh, dwellings and two, 300 retrofitted dwellings to certified passive houses or um, the ENFIT standard, which is the passive house retrofit standard. What we can see on the horizontal axes is the heating demand uh, that's been calculated in using PHPP and on the vertical axes, we have the consumption in practice. And we, you, you can see these, you know, you've got the black dots, um, which represent the projects, there's the red, a uh, dashed line which remain, would be kind of perfect congruent uh, performance. It doesn't happen in reality. We've got variations that take place. Individuals do different things, climates do different things. The most important thing to recognise here though is that on average, passive house is on the right track. You, we're within those kinds of performance parameters because there's uncertainty and uh, and there's uh, measurement error in the processes you know, in terms of the meters that you're using and also climatic variations from year to year and things like that. And what we, you know, we concluded that passive house works, you know, and co-heating tests, ways of measuring the actual heat loss from passive house buildings or from any building in truth. Um, but in passive houses, the, the, we've shown that those performance gaps are closed, that you, know, you don't get these big gulfs between um, the predicted performance and the as-built performance when it comes to the you know, performance of the building fabric itself. And also there's a, a, a very interesting meta study that was done uh, looking at ventilation and air quality and it found that 70 if you actually dig down into the stats which were never actually broken down in the meta study but you find that 70 percent of uk dwellings built to theoretically conform with part f of the building regulations actually fail the building regulations you know, they do not conform with providing the requisite air flows um but chalk and cheese uh you end up with 80 percent of passive house buildings satisfying that and i'll do that there is that 20 percent which always kind of annoys me. Um, but I think that really relates back to the, uh, the fact that the study was done on very when Passive House was very young in the UK. and We've got a much more robust supply chain now. So I'd expect to see if the meta study was repeated now, we'd see the, um, uh, you know, some uh, improvements again. So, you know, air quality, thermal comfort, uh, low energy uh, use are all kind of being demonstrated in practice. For, non, for domestic buildings and non-domestic buildings, archetype, uh, um, I should need to introduce them to you. Um, winners of the UK um, uh, leading, well, uh, HA100 Sustainable Practice Award. Um, you know, basically, they've gone back, they've monitored the energy performance of their school projects, and you know, they're demonstrating very high levels of congruence between the theoretical performance and as built, and there are lessons learned. There's no magic technology or specifications. It's all about integrated design using an embedding passive house to deliver a genuinely value engineered approach in, uh, to, um, to design. Air quality mentioned here uh, already, but you know, we've you know, measured the indoor carbon dioxide over over the course of a year and we can see that it's remaining within that 
uh, acceptable parameters up you know, virtually all the time uh, with very, very, you know, with no real excursions outside of um, those parameters. Cost is one of those things that often gets talked about with Passive House and people envisage that Passive House is somehow expensive like a Rolls Royce. Well, it's not true. Um, basically, what we here have here is some very interesting studies that have been done um, in Brussels. Um, there are there is UK there are UK studies as well, but um, I've got graphs for this one. Uh, basically, what we can see here that we've got the mean energy use of 20 kilowatt hours per meter square in all of this kind of body of information that's presented, and the mean average cost here is uh, 1,385 euros per meter square. Now, what gets interesting, of course, is when we start to re recognise that half of these buildings cost less than average. That's the nature of averages. Um, but we've also got some very high consuming you know, energy using buildings that are costing you know, le less than average. Well, interestingly, we've got some very low energy buildings costing less than average as well. So this is the bit where it, you know, this is where passive house, you know, experienced certified passive house designers can really play kind of a key role um, you know, on a project. So. In the words of W. Edwards Deming, um, you know, famous for issues associated with quality assurance and uh, management, your know, quality begins with intent. Start targeting passive, you know, the Reba 2030 challenge and passive house uh, standards, um, and then also fixing that through management, having the right processes in place. So, what does that look like? Um, how can we achieve the passive house standard? Well, it, all in all, it's relatively straightforward. Um, you know, there's a bit of a recipe that we can follow, and you know, with that uh, pr you know, good practice, we can kind of roll that out the same recipe again and again as a methodology, but we'll have different and various different results as we choose, um, you know, for, depending on the, the nature of the different projects and the requirements. So if we take the, you know, the recipe, um, you hear it's Wolfgang Feist, Coming up with the recipe and setting out those criteria. So those, you know, um, and we have uh, some ingredients that we're using. In this case, we've got uh, certified passive house components where necessary, or and also ver you know, the verified products that we're using. Uh, there are the scales, the uh, ways of metric, you know, understanding the metrics and setting boundary conditions. There's having the right skills in place uh, so that we can. Um, design buildings and construct them in an appropriate way. And then there are certain things that passive, the Passive House standard does not dictate. It doesn't dictate your budget. It doesn't dictate some of the tools you will use or the timeframes um, or the sequence in which certain things may necessarily happen to in order to deliver that certified Passive House building. And it's in that sort of those realms of um, ambiguity that the Passive House overlay is coming to the fore as we're moving into increasingly larger projects that are more complex uh, and, and uh, at an organisational level, we require more tools to help underpin and support our design processes. Uh, just to flag up, the Passive House Trust has got a wealth of uh, information about uh, delivering Passive House buildings in the UK context. I'll flag up the Claiming the Passive House Standard, which establishes those issues of consumer law so that you're not falsely stating that you're achieving Passive House principles, whatever that may be. Um, you know, there's some clarification that goes on there. And then there's also Quality Assurance for Large and Complex Buildings, which is a, both of these documents I've had the honour of um, uh, contributing to. Uh, the Large and Complex Buildings um, Projects uh, document is going to be reviewed and updated um, because we've got much more experience since 2015 when this was originally written. Now, uh, in terms of thinking about integrated design and integrating Passive House into your project, uh, it's first of all worth recognising the process that uh, we can go through. So going from pre-design all the way through to construction on the horizontal axes here, and then we've kind of got cost and effects on the vertical axes. So what we'll all recognise as designers is that there's the opportunity for change is greatest at the beginning of a project and diminishes as the project goes on. You know, it becomes very hard to move a window once you've put it in place, um, uh, but it's very easy to move a window at uh, an earlier design stage or when you're establishing the brief, but setting the project on the right target. Uh, then we've also got issues associated with uh, cost 
and it's very easy to make changes at an early in the project but as we get more embroiled in the the depth of design there's more documents to change and there's greater costs with moving windows in, you know, in buildings or whatever it may be um, so making sure that we get the design right from day one is key and that's where we really must start to think and re you know properly understand what we mean by uh, value engineering um, and that comes at those you know those really important stages where architects plus first designers key players in the projects yes and other engineers have got opportunities to really contribute and get the design on track um, and then you know, we can avoid those nasty cost cutting whereby you know, exercises that often get core value engineering but are really quite brutal because the contractor has been involved at a too late a stage and they have, you know, they have not had the opportunity to contribute in a meaningful fashion. So what does the process map look like? Um, well, first of all, you know, you've got your prototype designs, of course, we're looking at uh, you know, the basic shape and form of a building, the uh, construction products that might be used, and we feed that into a basic PHPP model that we can then review uh, with a certifier and we, you know, that before going to make a planning application. Then we can move forward into the next stage of refining the, you know, the PHPP models, updating our construction products, doing interim assessments using PHPP before moving forward to building regulations and eventually out to tender. And then it's that kind of full technical verification where once we're out on site, making sure that if material substitutions do take place, that they're properly tracked and recorded um, and that uh, we you build and commission the building in an appropriate way. So we've got the air tightness test, we've got the ventilation commissioning, the um, site manager has got to write a letter confirming that all of the, the construction conforms with the um, as you know, with, with the construction documents. And by the end of that, once it's been verified by a certifier, then we have a certified passive house building. Now, that's obviously kind of quite uh, a quick overview. The passive house overlay itself uh, goes into your know, breaks down the RIBA plan of work into the kind of stages that we're familiar with. And it also breaks it down to some key levels here. So you're looking at the delivery strategy um, about how you, what process need, processes need to be gone through um, for um, domestic buildings, retrofits, social housing, all can take, take part. Quality assurance is key um, in, in spelling out some of the key things and when certain things should happen so that uh, the various different parties understand the work um, and um, uh, the, the, the progress for uh, the, that uh, project would need to go through and then also thinking about procurement strategies so that we can make sure that we're getting everybody on board at the right time and avoiding some of those uh, apparent uh, cost issues that you can run into on any building project or ironing them out um, in the right way so that a passive house project can um, run very smoothly. Uh, and then we've also got a responsibility matrix that uh, sets out the client's roles and responsibilities, architecture and engineering contributions, how a certified passive house designer and consultant can uh, contribute meaningfully at the right time, uh, whilst also helping uh, at, the, uh, at the project level, everyone can be contributing to look at how building performance evaluation can be implemented in a project, not specific requirement to passive house, but something that obviously ties in with the REBA 2030 challenge. Um, SAP and SBEM model, models also need to be brought into play, um, along with uh, working with contractors, passive house certifiers, and various different information exchanges at key points to make sure that everyone knows what they're doing. OK, so that's that's the quick overview, um, looking at uh, what in terms of the passive house, uh, you know, being the world's leading quality assurance standard uh, for low energy buildings, having uh, known outcomes with no performance gaps and using tried and tested of processes that have been refined through the British UK community's experience, which is then feeding into the passive house overlay. Uh, so that's the, the quick romp through the um, passive house uh, overlay and um, that, that context which will allow Daniel to do a presentation about um, uh, his uh, his project in a moment. Right, so there's a short video about a passive house retro retrofit project that uh, I've recently completed. Um, thought it'd be interesting for you to get a bit of context there.
2014, Paul and Sully came to the Passive House Open Days up at Steel Farm. Afterwards, we got talking uh, about this project that they wanted to create for themselves. They'd, you know, they'd got a barn, they'd converted a barn next door, but it wasn't living up to their expectations and they wanted to create where we are now into their forever home. So that started a five year conversation about how to create that home and how to build it. The barn itself as a structure was not in good condition. There were signs of structural movement, there were cracks in the walls. The roof was an asbestos roof which had to be removed and replaced carefully and the, you know, the gables were in poor condition. The window openings were not really in an ideal size or position to allow good quality daylight inside the barn. We had to think of a way of getting light into the existing barn in such a way that it created a nice home without detracting from the quality of the existing building. Shepherd's Barn is the northeast first passive house benefit. What that means is it's been designed to minimise the amount of energy that's used for space heating and hot water, whilst also providing a very high standard of thermal comfort both in the summer and in the winter. When you look back on the construction process and some of you know, the challenges that came with restoring a, uh, an existing building and bringing it up to 21st century standards, what were some of the biggest challenges that you felt that you faced? I think what the, the biggest one was deciding um, not to go with the builder after we'd uh, gone out to tender and um, that was quite a worrying time but actually I think it resulted in a better build because uh, we felt a lot more part of the process and we could make decisions more easily. One of the most helpful things was going on the two day uh, course on passive housing. I think it reinforced all the principles of passive houses and it enabled us to understand better why the house was designed like it was and the importance of making it airtight not only the techniques to do it but how to do it and um, that was really really useful in helping us with the challenge of project managing so how are you how are you finding living in the house I, I, I'm really, really happy. I think it uh, just feels very comfortable. Um, the links to the outside really enjoy. So it's like, you know, the terrace is like an extra room, which we use a lot. Air quality is fantastic. You know, the light is good. We use all aspects like the west side. We come out and sit here and have meals quite frequently. We've got a sunken area on the south side that we can go if there's strong south westerlies coming in. So it sits in the environment really well. It's not a massive house and I wouldn't want a massive house. It's plenty big enough when we have the family round, but it's also not so big when there's the two of us there. It's very easy to live in, uh, it's comfortable. We know it uses very little energy, which is the big thing. That's what we really wanted was a house that didn't use much energy and we know it doesn't. Oh, we're we're completely self-sufficient, so we've got zero energy costs. We're actually exporting yeah. to the grid. So really, we only have a couple of radiators on for a few hours a day for a few months of the year. We wanted some land to set up the community orchard. At the time, we weren't going to do allotments, it was just community orchard. And then we realised we had the land sufficient to do 
allotments as well. And it, it all sort of fitted in with what we wanted to do for the community as well as for ourselves. The location for us was just brilliant because it's like 10 minutes walk to the village, but for all intents and purposes, you're out in the countryside. So it was a perfect compromise, wasn't it? Sonia as an extrovert looks towards the village. Me as an introvert looks out <laughs> there. So I'll just uh, close with um, basically saying yes, that you can watch that video and other videos about projects that um, my practice has completed uh, over at PassiveHouseSecrets.co.uk. Um, if you wanted to find out a bit more about Passive House training, uh, becoming a certified Passive House designer, then go to PassiveHouseTraining.co.uk. And if you want to find me, you can find me on uh, social media um, uh, you know, at Mark Siddle R-I-B-A. I think uh, with any, without any further ado, I'll just pass it back to Sarah and um, you can hear a bit more for, about Daniel, from Daniel. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. I always love hearing you present and I always do come away with some sort of new nugget of information or a new way of thinking about Passive House, which I always really value. And today it has to be thinking about the Passive House process in the same way that I think about baking. So thank you for that. I'll take that with me. Um, I'm sure everybody in the session today will agree that that was a really excellent kind of deep dive into Passive House and how it fits into the kind of 2030 plan and also this new development work around the overlay. So it's exciting times. So everybody do keep posting your questions in the chat box. And as I mentioned at the start of the session today, we're going to do the Q&A after our next speaker. So let me move on and introduce um, our second speaker today, Daniel Dyer, who's an architect at Moss & Kerr um, Architects, where he's a project architect. Um, and he was the project architect for Star and Shadow Cinema, which won the McEwen Award in 2019, which is a really fantastic project. It was for a cinema and venue and it was built by volunteers. So I do recommend you look that one up. He's also worked on several uh, several uh, exemplar low energy homes, including a Reba House of the Year finalist and also the project that um, he's going to be speaking about today, which is Oak Tree House, which was the first passive house in Tyneside, which will be the focus of the, the presentation, as I say. So uh, in 2019, he was also long listed on Reba's Rising Stars cohort, which reflected his work in developing both timber frame systems um, and his sort of work around uh, the wider low energy design. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Daniel, who's going to lead us through this case study project. It's great to have Daniel following on from Mark as this presentation um, is a great way to show you how to put all the great information Mark's given us today into practice in a real project. Mark also showed us that video of the retrofit to the Passive House Enerfit standard, which was a wonderful community based project or a really community focused project. It was nice to see all the stuff at the end about um, how they were engaging in a wider way beyond the building. And then Daniel's going to be telling us um, about how they designed the Oak Tree House, which is a Passive House new build. So we're getting the full range today. Um, and the, the total embodied carbon as well is an interesting thing on Oak Tree House because that was lower than the Reba 2030 uh, climate challenge target. So I think Daniel will probably talk a bit through that. Um, so yeah, great to have both retrofit and new build covered today and just show that you know these standards and these really ambitious targets can be applied to the full remit of the buildings that we have in the UK. Um, so the, the Oak Tree Passive House is really an exemplar piece of low energy uh, residential architecture. It displays innovation in the process as well as in the completion, which I'm really looking forward to hearing more about. Um, it's also, as I said, the first certified Passive House in uh, Tyneside, and it combines this kind of delight with the robustness in the design and delivery. And before I hand over to Daniel, I'm just going to leave you with this great quote from the client of the building um, who was giving feedback on on the passive house building and what it was like to live in by saying that it's just a delight. And I think that's often feedback that we get on passive house projects is that the people who are actually spending time in these buildings, whether they're schools or offices or homes, it's just they're a delight to be in because of the um, really exemplar air quality and thermal comfort that these buildings deliver. Um, I think Daniel's just popping back in, but while while we're waiting um, for Daniel to come, there's been a few questions. I can see Daniel sitting himself back down against 
so we'll, we'll go back to Daniel in a second but just while I've got Mark on and um, let's just raise a, a couple of questions which have which have come out one was around cost when you were talking about cost Mark someone was asking can the low energy um, building standard rather than the pacifist classic standard be used as a way to save money I think was the the question for the project um I I think my, my personal opinion here is that well you if you've got if for some reason you're building a passive house and you fail you know you you fail your air tightness you you just miss out by a bit it's more like a near miss standard the low energy building standard than something you should be targeting um I think that you you know, you could use it as a target in its own right but for me it's if I've um failed uh, <laughs> it's my fallback kind of position I think that the the cost savings that you'd get are nominal. I think that you know, experienced passive house designers understand that things like form factor and other elements, you know, subtle elements of design, just digging into the details, that's where the where where you can deliver the value of a of a good project. Um, yeah, I don't see a reason never to target personally. Uh, passive, you know, anything other than passive house, um, you may not get there for certain sets of quirky reasons that are outside of your control and um yeah that's why the, that's why that uh, the low energy building standard is useful but i'd always kind of encourage people to if you've never built a passive house building before um then you definitely need to yeah then certifying yeah, is required in, in all circumstances Great, right, thanks, Mark. I think that was that's a nice way to think about it. I mean, that's the way we always think about it as the trust as well, that it's a standard there to catch projects which have not quite made it rather than something to aim at in the first place. I'm going to pose one more question, Mark, and then we will move on to Daniel's presentation. We can save the rest of all these interesting questions for the end. So someone's asking, they're not a certified passive house designer and they've got a client who's really keen to design a project which is a passive house certified project. They're asking if they need to be certified to be able to produce a passive House which is certified and what kind of would be the best way for them to move forward with the project? Uh, no, that's a great question and a, and a classic question at that. I think the you know, the, the scenario here is one whereby you don't have to be a certified passive house designer to complete a passive house building. Normally, um, you know, but you can become a certified passive house designer if you completed two passive house buildings um, and got that experience behind you. The key lesson though is that um, you know you can also pin the tail on the donkey when you're blindfolded. Um, I yeah I think that you're better. Uh, you would certainly be benefit from having the support of a certified passive house designer as to build a PHPP model. And the key there's a key thing here: a certified passive house designer is separate from the certifier. So that yeah the certifier is there to provide third party oversight to make sure everything's been done properly. So you would need to team up with a certified passive house designer that can um, help steer you in the right direction and a certifier so that you can then be certified. Of course, there are costs associated with that. And therefore, that's why architects often uh, and engineers are qualifying as certified passive house designers themselves so that they can bring those skills and knowledge to bear um, with as little pain, should we say, <laughs> as possible yeah. by closing that learning curve. Absolutely, that's great. Thank you, Mark, for that. And I think that's one of the key things is that you, you can learn as you do it. So it could be that the first project um, you work on, you're not certified during, but by teaming up with these experienced individuals um, really will let you gain all that knowledge which has been developed in the UK over the last decade as buildings have been being delivered to that standard. And again, the, the early appointment of a passive house certifier is really great because those guys have a huge amount of experience with a range of projects and can really add value to the team. Um, and you'll need, if you're getting certified, you'll need them at some point. So we always recommend if you can get them um, involved early around REBA stage two. Um, okay. I I think we'll we'll pause the Q&A again and we'll let Daniel um, introduce uh, the Oak Tree Passive House. Over to you, Daniel. Hi, so thanks very much um, for, for having me. Thanks, Sarah and Mark. Um, had a little bit of a bit of a Teams um, meltdown just then. So that's uh, great that I'm, I'm back in um, and, and I can tell you about this uh, really great project that um, was a pleasure to work on, which is um, Oak Tree Passive House, um, which is in Wickham. Um, here, here it is in all its glory. It's um, a large clad um, kind of modernist building um, built around an existing um, oak tree, which is on on the site. And um, 
Yeah, it's uh, it was the the first passive house in Tyneside. We're kind of a little bit behind um, Mark, who's kind of pioneered passive house in the northeast, and and he's he, he built a couple of passive houses, um, you know, slightly further afield. But um, we've come on and we've um, you know been inspired by that and learned um, how we can do it ourselves. Um, Dan, the director at um, Mawson Co, went on the passive house certifier course, um, and then this is the first one. That we completed um, and it was a design and collaboration with kind of a design and build firm set up by the the practice which was called Shawm. Um, so here it is um, so it's got this cantilever balcony which is obviously initially when we were first looking at the scheme that's a a, a challenge um, it was actually designed by another designer which I'll come back to that but um, the the cantilever obviously it's it's potentially big thermal bridges um, and there could be big challenges with that, but um, you know we found ways to to mitigate that on this project. Um, so here's the the site plan, the the proposed the the finished site plan, as it were. Um, so as you can see, to the to the east of the site, um, you've got all these trees, um, which are and to, to the south, um, which are, which are, is a group TPO. So they're um, mature oak trees, a big grouping of them. Um, and they became a, a really big driver in in the scheme. Um, so you you enter from the the top of the site, you come down. There's a garage, and then you come into the house. Um, then on the top floor of the house, you've got your living area and kitchen, dining area, and um, sort of a library snug space. Um, and then there's also kind of a fourth bedroom and um, a shower room. And you've got this uh, a nice staircase, which is um, Kind of open to the to the roof with a roof light above um, and the central volume um, of the of the scheme has a higher ceiling level so you've kind of got more of more snug spaces where the dining room is and then the, the kitchen living room is a bit grander with a really high ceiling um, and then when you come down onto the the lower ground floor you've got all your bedrooms you've got kind of all your services tucked back against that north wall the ensuite the bathroom, um, the plant room and the utility room um, with all the MBHR and all that stuff in the plant room. Um, just drop back, you can see there's there's about four radiators in the scheme. There's uh, one in the living room and there's one in, there's towel rails then in the um, shower room and then in the bathroom and then another one in the ensuite. So there's, there's four um, in total and they just low level heat as as needed, but um, yeah, not much because it's a it's past us. Um, so this is the section so you can see the kitchen area has this higher volume um, and then the kitchen's a bit lower. Um, so the dining room is a little bit lower there. So yeah, this was the the big all these metrics that you, that you work to get to when you're doing a passive house and it was extremely, you know, we were extremely pleased when we got the final OK through. We'd, we'd obviously never done it um, before um had had one certified um so when you get it it's just uh, tremendously exciting and um obviously working in the team with the contractor um there's there's all sorts of areas where they're you know working so hard to get um air tightness and you know we'd worked hard together on the the details for the air tightness and all those things and then there's all the other things back on the the design side which um you know i'm responsible i was responsible for whether it's measure, measuring things for the phpp or the thermal bridge analysis we were doing um, and you're you know you, you're you're all working together to the same and you're just hoping that you know you don't let down the site guys with your stuff and, and they're working hard to hit the airtime it's too so so when we got it you know the first one we got it's just um, a really great uh, moment so the the air change rate was 0.36 so the minimum is um, 0.6 so um, that was uh, that was a good result from the builders and shows a lot of hard work there. Um, so in terms of the Reba climate challenge, um, when we started the scheme, this this didn't exist. Um, so we weren't necessarily targeting it, but as a practice, we've we've generally um, generally tried to produce steel as much as we can. Um, we like to build in timber um, and we like breathable construction. And also we try and reduce concrete um, and for various reasons. Um, uh, it, we, we did we did develop a low embodied carbon structure, and as for the operational energy, you've got 
you've got your less than 15 kilowatt hours from um, from your heating demand. So then uh, the, the overall operational energy is still is still below the 2030 target. Um, so um, this is the existing site, and there was a long um, history on this site because the the client that bought this house, and which you can see in the top right, they bought it um, 20 years prior to eventually building the house, and they bought it with the purpose that they could build on this side garden. You can see it's um, it's kind of like a house builder development estate. Um, but as you can see, this this house in the corner, which which has got the red line around it, um, had a really large garden. It looks like it's kind of a leftover site that was maybe earmarked for housing, but perhaps it became a bit too difficult with the existing trees there um, and the slope. So they just they just let it be. That's that's what we estimate happened. Um, and so the client had gone to permission, tried to get permission 20 years before, um, not being able to, and then eventually. Um, with the the designer they were working with, they got permission for their their house. Um, and this was the planning design concept architecture, a different different company from us. They did the, the planning, um, and then we took it on um, and kind of brought together a team to deliver this house after that point. Um, so we we didn't put in a new planning application, but we just tried to. Um, alter the design to get it um, how, how we'd like it for. It was various things. We just think we needed to simplify some elements for um, just the way we thought it, it was going to look, and also for passive house reasons. Um, and you'll note that we we conceded kind of putting in this screen on the ground floor below the balcony because we thought um, you know there's no way you can get a big cantilever on this timber structure. So so we'll put in a kind of a screen element on the ground floor so we can hide some structure in there and maybe get some. In that retaining wall, um, but as the project developed, um, it was different. Oh yes, yeah, so here's the, uh, the penguin slide. Um, so yeah, we, when we first put this in for the PHPP, we we got the initial check over to Peter One. We found we were a bit high. Um, the there was various things working against us. We'd um, I think we had the climate zone we put in um, for the the North Yorkshire one. So with with passive house, you kind of get um, positioned. Um, in the country based on which um, local authority we're in and the time where local authorities is um, assigned this weather station up in um, in the Scottish borders and we'd we'd naively assumed that we could um, use the weather data from the, the the nearer one which is in North Yorkshire so it made a bit of difference and not a bit um, meant you know we needed more heat to heat this to heat this house so our heat demand, which needed to be 15, was was three kilowatt hours over. Um, I think there was changes to the treated floor area, um, and we also had some concerns over overheating. So, at that stage, um, you know, we'd we'd not, you know, Mark's already done the slide about getting it all lined up really early on. Well, we we'd come at it a bit later on, and then we were having to adapt um, to to get it where we needed it. Um, but the team we created, um, so the, we'd started a contracting team with um, a contact we'd built another house with. Um, so it was it was kind of an architect contractor um, company, design and build, um, with Mawson Co acting as the architects working for that company, as it were. Um, and that created um, a new way of doing it so that we could kind of handle these difficulties, handle the challenges of having to adapt the design and the construction together um, in order to meet the standards we were trying to meet. Um, so I've got up here now partnering. So we used a JCT partnering contract, which is a um, way we hadn't worked before. And it's usually used on big projects, but we wanted to um, you know, try and do things differently. So we wanted to use a partnering contract on this, this on this one-off house um, and we also had this project protocol um, so the partner contract the way that works this JCT constructing excellence contract is instead of having a fixed price for the build um, it, you have a, a target cost um, which everyone works to hit and then there's a guaranteed maximum cost and then 
the the diff when you move from target cost up to guaranteed maximum cost, the the extras, as it were, are shared between the um, the contract team, the contractor, and the client, so that um, you're, it encourages everyone to work together to get things together on budget, um, and then the and it, sorry, and it also ideally stops you pricing in lots of risk, stops a contractor pricing in lots of risk because um, if you know if the unforeseen things do happen, then there is the opportunity for it to go up, but um, that's kind of the target, so that the risk isn't priced in. Um, and then the project protocol is a document that we all signed, um, which outlines what we're trying to achieve and also the way we're going to treat one another in order to get there. Um, you know, simple things like if I pick one up, like early warning of newly uncovered problems, quite a good thing to agree to early on because um, you can have some, sometimes have a culture on a project where people leave other people's problems to them um, and they're not helping one another out, which was kind of the attitude on the project is we wanted contractor to help architect, architect to help contractor. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a challenging site. I mean, there's lots of architects on this um, presentation. I'm sure some of you have had more difficult ones on tight urban sites, but th this was challenging for other reasons. So we had because these trees are all very important, beautiful trees, tree protected. Um, we we had a specific place we could dig around them, as you can see here, to to create the foundations. But we weren't allowed to store anything on these tree roots or you know drive diggers over them or anything like that so um we had to kind of stagger how we brought everything onto the site we also have a very steep site so we couldn't bring cranes um to lift you know large timber panels and that sort of thing onto the site uh, the trees also get in the way of cranes so it, it was challenging and it affected the way that we um designed the building um, and the building system that we used um, so in terms of, you know, we, we'd we'd started working with this contract. We were we were closely knit with him, and we worked together to kind of kind of um, develop the building systems we were going to use. Um, at Moss and Kerr, we often on the projects in the past, you know, we like to use timber where possible. We like um, vapor permeable construction. We like so that's avoiding sort of PIR in your timber frame where you can but have something that can breathe. Um, airtight construction, um, which is really important for passive house. Wind tight construction, so you're not your U values actually mean something. You're not losing the heat from the outside. We like them to be well insulated. We like to use local materials where we can. Um, have thermal bridge free construction. Um, we like to make sure there's fresh air ventilation. We like triple glazing, and as we've said before, I like to reduce the steel and concrete. Um, so what we settled on for this project is that we would build it using a twin frame timber frame. Um, so that means it's essentially like um, there's a 140 timber frame on the outside, which sits on a um, low thermal conductivity block, and there's a 95 mil on the inside that sits on the low thermal conductivity block, and then they're connected together um, every now and again so that they can't fall over, as it were. But um, obviously, it's very good um, to reduce the thermal transfer between the inside and the outside. Um, then you have a breather board on the outside, so you, you use a, um, a board that allows moisture to escape um, and an airtight on the inside. Um, and the way we the way we worked in order to help the contractor out is we, um, as Morton Kerr, started to adopt some of the the roles that we maybe wouldn't typically typically do. So we um, did the timber frame shop drawings, as it were, because we found that there was ways that we could use our model um, to automate the production of drawings um, and and 3D model of the timber frame, um, which was important because we we wanted to bring wanted to bring materials on site at the right time so that we were not having big stores of materials at various times, which obviously we couldn't do because we've got these trees and the um, the TPOs and all those issues in the way. So we needed to bring things on as we needed them. And we could do that when we scheduled out every timber in the build, um, scheduled out every panel in the build um, so that you, you could build the timber frame from these drawings 
Um, so it's breaking down the timber frame into um, every, every little component so that you can, you know, systemize it. Um, and that gives you these sort of long lists, cutting lists that we we needed. Um, so we we could um, what we did was we made sure every single stud in the building was cut by the timber merchants and then delivered at the correct time. Um, so we we could have the ground floor studs delivered. Uh, sorry, the lower ground floor studs delivered at the beginning, and then when the the first floor was on, we could have the first floor studs delivered. And then when the roof was on, you could have the parapet um, timbers delivered. And then, um, so this works for the vertical timbers because you have lots of repetitive sizes, obviously. Well, you know, all the all the studs on the lower ground floor are going to be the same all on the upper ground. Um, and then the, the plates and all your lintels, all the horizontal timbers, all varied in size. So you just have them um, cut on site. Um, and then, so I mentioned about the, the steel for the balcony detail. We'd We'd almost conceded that we could have, we could position some steels underneath the balcony to pick it up, but um, the structural engineers at JCC we work with, um, they suggested, well, why don't we put a plywood box beam on top of the whole building, and then we can hang the balcony off that. Um, so, so that's what we did, and it it was useful because um, being built from plywood, it didn't need to be one giant beam delivered. Um, you know, to site, it didn't need to be a big steel lifted onto the roof. Um, there would be no airtight issue, thermal bridge issue, because we're not puncturing thermal envelope. We're literally putting it on the roof. Um, and then this is the only steel in the building, you know, other than fixings and things. Um, these lightweight components that then hang um, glue line structures from them. Um, so yeah, this 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 is the engineer's drawing in the top. So you've got a um, you've got, if you can see my mouse, you've got a big holding down strap that runs up there. So that's holding the back of this beam. Then you've got a, a vertical timber there, which is kind of the pivot point. Um, so you have these giant timbers going in that could um, support support this. Um, and then to the bottom right, you've got it, it wrapped up. Um, so as I said, when we, we first measured this house, we were slightly struggling on our um, heat demand. Um, and one way we were bringing that back was we um, we modelled all the thermal bridges for the building. Um, and some of you might have experienced with SAP, um, and there's a difference between SAP thermal bridges and um, passive house, because in SAP, um, generally in the UK, you measure the thermal bridge, no, sorry, you measure the heat loss areas, so um, all the heat loss through the walls and all the heat loss through the floor and all the heat loss through the roof, you measure that to the inside face of um, the structure. Whereas with passive house, you measure it to the outside face, which means um, for the wall, you're going to measure all the way down to the bottom of the, the floor. And with the floor, you're going to measure all the way out to the edge of the wall. So it means you're sort of double counting in the corners. Um, but that's a, that's a sensible way of doing it for the for the passive house system because um, it means generally if a building is designed thermal bridge free or with good details you can assume that there isn't too much extra loss through there so it's a fair assumption um, you just slightly overestimate so it covers it and it it maybe simplifies the amount of processing um, whereas with sap it becomes really important that you do measure that detail because you haven't accounted for it um, so, so we modelled all of these. Um, that was another thing we had to learn for, to, to deliver this scheme was um, how to model um, all the thermal bridges. Um, so we did that and that that helped us a lot and brought us back up to where we needed to be. Um, but the other layer with Pass Fast is Mark's talked about the QA system and that's something I'd really um, attest to is that um, it does, it does um, really encourage like good working practices because you have to provide evidence for the things that you're designing. So um, th this is sort of the same detail, but some of the evidence we compiled for it. Um, so you, we ha you have to take photographs showing the thickness of insulation in that area. You have to um, have photos of the, the products that have been delivered, the um, the installation of it. Um, and on this one, the the 
the inner blocks below the ground level. We'd um, we designed it so that they were dry thermal conductivity blocks, so they had a DPM underneath and they weren't um, wet and therefore not performing as well as they would do otherwise. So you then have to evidence that that DP DPC has gone in the right place so that you hit that target. So yeah, it's a rigorous process, um, but it, it helps you um, focus on what, what you're drawing, what exactly you're putting in, um, and helps the contractor provide evidence for it. Um, this was a, a junction we worked on, so the um, the contractor we're working with um, had seen this on a, another timber framers um, system, and um, what what you traditionally do in a timber frame at the first floor junction is you you build the first floor straight off the ground floor, um, but then as you can imagine, um, when it comes to trying to have an airtight layer, a continuous layer, you've got the difficult um, joint where you've got to take the air tightness barrier from the inside right to the outside of the building and then back in. Um, so we adopted the ledger system. So you basically fix a timber around the inside um, of the internal wall and then you hang the internal joists of it. And that way you can just run your membrane or your board behind it. Um, and you're not going to have the same issues with having to get around these difficult junctions. Um, so for this project, we used um, Intello, which is a intelligent airtight membrane. It's it's good because it can allow some vapor to escape. Um, we've since built um, other houses which have achieved better airtight results using the airtight board, um, and we've found that's probably more more robust. Um, so this was 0.36. The with the airtight board, we've we've got down to 0.15. Um, I think Mark's got a lot lower still than that on some of um, his projects. So um, maybe the, the membrane doesn't get you the lowest, but it is a good product um, because of the way it deals with moisture. Um, and then you've got your whole building ventilation system, your MVHR. Um, looks like we had the same one as, as um, Mark's one. This, this is the pool um, Novus 300 designed by Green Building Store. Um, the, the ducts are rigid, um, which means they kind of have to be installed as they were um, as they were designed, and then it gets commissioned by a green building store, which is important for the passive house um, requirements. Um, so the way this works is that you're um, pulling the air out of the warmer um, rooms, which are where you get heat sources from, often the wet rooms, like the kitchen, the bathroom, utility, and then you're pushing air into the other rooms, the living rooms, um, dining room, uh, bedrooms. And then as the air is pulled out of the bathrooms, kitchens, utilities, it's going through a heat exchanger and then fresh air from outside that comes in um, is warmed up by that outgoing air. So um, that's what partly why air tightness is so important on these schemes, because um, it means rather than losing heat through drafts, you're, you're directing it through your MVHR so that you can warm up your incoming air. Um, and these units are, are up to 90% efficient. So you can imagine that's huge energy savings on um, sort of a naturally ventilated system. Um, but I mean, we always encourage clients to go with the, you know, really good um, products and, des and designers in this um, case, because often in um, kind of other eco houses where they're trying to trying to kind of part do the system um, lower quality installations and designs yeah can be noisy and um, are more likely to go wrong so it's definitely somewhere to encourage clients to invest in a properly designed system um, so yeah I've pulled this back up because I was you know really pleased when it got um, certified um, and I think it's worth um, dwelling on um, the thermal kind of the comfort of these houses um, the um, the there's many things that when you start to design low energy houses there's there's potential pitfalls which um, you can fall into whether that's um, you know the house overheating or the sort of things you hear about where people say oh someone built a low energy house and it was always overheating or um, you know they're not allowed to open window all these sort of things or the MVHR units really loud um, but actually the reason passive house is a good system is because um, there's there's mitigations for all of those issues that's why 
that's why it, it works as a system because um, obviously when you start insulating everything and making airtight buildings, there are certain problems that can occur if you don't do it properly. Um, but Passifast mitigates them. That's kind of the, the purpose of it. Um, so we're really pleased with how it sat in the landscape. Um, the the trees are just um, beautiful and that um, kind of helped make the scheme for us. Um, and yeah, this this internal environment is you know really peaceful. Um, and you know, you don't have drafts, you don't have um, that cold feeling when you walk past a, a cold window. Um, and and on this particular scheme, so you've got these great views, long views out those windows um, to the right, and then you've got closer views to the um, protected trees um, with all sorts of squirrels and things going on in there. So it's a lovely place to live. And clients are really pleased to live in the bright light space. Um, as you can see, the kitchen with the higher volume um, than the the living area. And then this is uh, yeah another photo of the um, so that volume that extra volume in the kitchen it actually doesn't help you help you with your heat demand because you're heating bigger space. Um, and then you've got a view out to your um, tree and uh, just finish us off. Yeah. So this we're really pleased with this balcony and, and the that detail that um, we developed and then we used we, you know we used that for some shading that we we needed on to help reduce um summer overheating issues and that's it with um yeah with the the balcony and uh, yeah look forward to some questions coming up next um so i think i'm passing back to um sarah now We can hear you, Sarah. Okay, great. I can see the live button now. Super. Thank you, Daniel. I really loved hearing about that project. It's the first time I've actually seen a presentation on the project and it was a delight to get that insight today. So thank you. And what lucky clients. No wonder they're so pleased to get to live in that home. I found it really interesting to hear about how Passive House was used. Um, even though you didn't get to do it from the very earliest stages, you still used the process to simplify the design. And I think that everybody would agree that the delight in the architecture retirement design is like absolutely retained so you don't lose that through these simplifications it can actually drive a better design um, at the end which I think is really interesting and by using that passive house standard to drive those efficiency improvements through those design decisions and then through the simplification of the detailed design for example your solution for the cantilever you get to then have savings and those design efficiency savings can offset extra cost for that higher quality fabric and especially as Mark had said the biggest impact of course is when we do that from the earliest stages and when it is done in that way it is possible to build these very high performing buildings at no extra cost so I think that's something we should all all keep in mind when we're talking to, to clients about passive house buildings. And so I'm sure there's a lot of what I can see. There's everybody uh, is keen to get involved in this really important conversation. So I'm going to get straight on to some of your questions. <coughs> Mark has been doing a super job actually of answering stuff live in the, the Q&A um, box, but I'm going to still pose some of these because I feel like not everybody's probably following it because I'm sure people were really concentrating on Daniel's presentation. So I might just send some back your way, Mark, and then there's some questions which have popped up for Daniel too. Um, so Mark, first of all, we're going to go through just some more of the questions which came up, which are more kind of project specific, and then there's some on the overlay, which I'll, I'll save for the end. So what did you do with the external walls in that record? of it project to avoid any moisture issues when you're talking about how you're going to insulate and make those airtight well we weren't making the walls airtight necessarily um you it was a barn conversion uh it wasn't a house uh so we have a ventilated cavity so the masonry walls have been reconstructed using lime mortar and uh we are currently we've got some probes in the cavities to see what's actually happening in practice because that's how i roll uh, that we like to find out what's going on in practice and um so far with you know everything's positive should we say uh, so we've got a timber frame uh, which is our airtight construction now there's nothing i think there's a common miss i think part of this question also hinges at a common misunderstanding between a difference between airtightness and moisture 
um, and vapor permeability and capillarity and, and all of the aspects of moisture transfer, surface diffusion, call it, you know, lots of the different bits of science to throw at you there. Now, there is no, you know, when we're talking about the preservation of a building, uh, whether it's new build or existing, air tightness is absolutely fundamental. You, if you don't get it right, um, if you, you, building regulations do an atrocious job with air tightness. Yeah, they focus on energy and carbon emissions and they completely ignore, apart from some very dull recognition in part C that air tightness is useful. There is no performance requirement and no demonstration that there's an understanding. But if we look at air tightness in other countries around the world and research that's been done, like real research by physicists, we find that we should be targeting something in the order of 0.5 meters cubed per meter square at 50 pascals or less to avoid moisture damage being caused to timber structures and the likes. So, yeah, I thought it was an important one to make some clarification on that. Thank you, Mark. That was really helpful. Um, Daniel, a question has come in about contractors pricing and risk. And the question was whether you feel that at the moment that's a barrier to passive house uptake in the northeast. Um, I might, yeah, it it's probably. Um, I mean, partly why why we developed that um, kind of working as a design and build team was to mitigate that because um, the if the contractor could influence the design um, and, and have power over the change because it was design and build and we could also be involved, then you can mitigate costs risks to some degree. Um, so yeah, I think some contracts, contractors would put a premium on um, passive house, um, but it's just trying to find ways to um, mitigate that. The way we've done it, we're, we're built, we're, we're trying, well, we don't know if it's certified yet, but we're aiming for certification on a house we're building up in Walkworth. And the way we've done it on that is we've used um, a frame provider, window provider, an MVHR provider that is um, has a track record of passive house and then everything else in the building becomes um, kind of standard construction which would be obviously there needs to be uh, yeah some um, extra awareness of um, air tightness and, and the MVHR and that sort of thing but it's not like it's totally crazy so that's one way is you utilize off-site construction and systems that can come together for you on site um, so that you mitigate the risks for the contractor and then you know make it make it nice for them so that they're more likely to want to be involved on the um what's seen as a tricky project thank you that was really i mean i think the key takeaway for me in listening to you and from the experience of working on projects is that it's that collaborative approach which is so critical to getting successful projects regardless of what the energy target is actually and having early engagement with contractors is really critical to getting full buy-in from everybody and getting everybody on board with all of the detailing it's like if everybody's contributed to what's what approaches are being taken it's much more likely to be a successful project so kind of two stage or three stage um, um, tendering uh, seems to be quite popular and also you know different variations of pre-construction services agreements with contractors on larger projects just to get that early engagement it's really really important um mark this is probably a quick one for you um how much of a building needs to be retained to be able to class it as an benefit rather than a new build uh i'm not aware of any specific specification relating to that was there any issue with the yeah. sort of confirming it on the project um that you presented no no um i mean basically um you know, there was structural you know, structural issues that meant that we had to do underpinning and re you know rebuilding of certain sections of the wall uh of, of, the, of the walls but uh i mean as a retrofit you know, we have the fact whereby we were constrained by planning into fitting into the existing form of the existing property um, and that meant that the form factor wasn't what we'd do if we were a new build. So yeah. it, what it's kind of, it, the, Shepherd's Barn falls into a bit, bit of an unusual circus, set of circumstances whereby it's kind of almost a new build set inside an existing building. Um, our air tightness was 0.18 for, um, you know, for example, which you wouldn't typically expect of a, a regular retrofit. Um, yeah, and, and, and just to pick up with Daniel's point, uh, the best project that uh, I've been involved with and I know that Mick Woolley is in the audience. Uh, Larch Corner which won the UK Passive House Awards this year, the air leakage would fit onto a, the square of a one penny coin, uh, 198 square millimetres. 
uh, 244 times more airtight re than required by UK building regulations. So passive house isn't hard. You can do a lot more than that if you wanted to do. I'm not saying you should try and chase those things. It was a freak accident, should we say, um, um, but it just goes to show you can do a lot more than um, you know, we tend to think. Super, thanks, Mark. And I think the in response to the the initial kind of question about what what point a building crosses over from being an benefit to a new build, I think having the early again appointment of a certifier uh, means that you've got someone that you can just check little sort of nuanced things if you've got a project where you think it might be borderline. Uh, there was another kind of related question, which was uh, about is it allowed to have a project as, uh, adopt the passive house standard post planning? Um, I think I saw Mark uh, respond to that one as well in the chat. So I'll, I'll start off by saying it can be, passive house can be applied to a project at any point. Um, it's just most sensible to do it early on in the project. Mark, do you have anything you want to add to that or Daniel in fact? Yeah, I yeah, completely endorse that is the case of, you know, you can put lipstick on a gorilla um, you know, at any stage, uh, but I think the, the key thing is um, if you want, if your client has a budget, in my experience, most clients do, uh, then you want to be thinking about the finances first. Otherwise, you're effectively retrofitting a new building design, which for me just smacks of professional incompetence um, you know, and questionable uh, kind of performance there. You, know, you want to approach it properly with all the you know, the right things. So you can be taking due care of the client's budget and their intentions so that you can deliver the project appropriately. Yeah, Daniel, do you have anything to add? Because you had the challenge of taking on a project which had not been setting passive houses the standard about yeah. that point. So. Yeah, there was there was some attempt for it to be a passive house scheme prior to our involvement, um, but it was kind of just a couple of pages of um, someone working it out. Um, and. Yeah, then it's applying all the products to it and all those things and suddenly you get a real picture of where it is. Um, but yeah, ideally you do it as early as possible. And and I'm also interested in the idea of if, if you do have it as parameters, how can it kind of start to inform a new architectural language? Um, yeah. So things like whether there's there's ways of putting structure outside of things, um, which there's just opportunities there for people to be creative and think if you if you if you know these parameters it can lead to interesting yeah. ideas and that's I think something we'd like to see going forward is, is people um, architects coming with their ideas and how an architectural language can come out of this so it's it's not just a, a spreadsheet thing but it becomes a full um, architectural um, you know design exercise yeah who, who'd have thought ethical architecture hey you know yeah. basically you know yeah. we can use, you you know, there's a whole I, I just want to get behind Daniel on that you know there's a whole key thing here that you know there is a uh, there's a, a whole new expression a whole new architectural language waiting for us uh, to explore it you know, which is basically uh, having good design that, and this includes a proper understanding of building physics. It's not some sort of fanciful recognition of um, Le Corbusier's houses, which you know, we knew in 1936 that Le Corbusier's projects overheated. You know, we still haven't learned those lessons. Um, you know, we, you know, we need to kind of get to grips with good design and embed it from the start. And there's a whole new architectural language, which is exciting, fun and different. And you know, we will all bring our own approach to that and buildings will look different and that's great. But they can't. We can't just keep with infectious repetitis. You know that, that uh, infection that affects too many projects. Yeah, great. Thank you both. That was very. Um, it's always refreshing to hear people see this as something which is a really positive intervention in the kind of architectural language, rather than something which is restrictive. Because that's how we see it too. It very much is just an another parameter which just makes buildings better. Um, Daniel, there was a question which was around product specification. It came in actually, I think, before you really started speaking about that. So I think in a way your presentation answered the question. Um, it followed on from Mark's presentation, which was obviously looking at more traditional stone building. And the question was, you know, can you use timber instead of bricks? Can you use natural insulation instead of petroleum based? And then what do we do about the foundations? So I think you probably answered the first two parts by showing us a timber frame building with um, with natural insulation. But the, the question around foundations is always interesting. Was there anything that you did specifically around embodied carbon on those? Um, no, I mean, the, the the embodied carbon in the project is in those foundations and the, the retaining wall. There's, um, yeah, there's there's work to do in finding ways of building foundations with less um, carbon. Um, 
and uh, yeah, that's another challenge to everyone. But um, yeah, no, you you can build passive houses fairly agnostic to um, building uh, material. You can build in timber frame, you can build in block work, um, CLT. There's, there's you can do almost any. Um, it's just uh, there's advantages to different ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the other questions was, which is sort of related, people were wondering about the embodied carbon calculation. So I'm going to give you three questions in a one or here. Um, one question came up all to do with programs. So one question was, what CAD or BIM program were you using to develop the project? Another was around the software that you used for the thermal bridge analysis. And the last one was around the software that you used for the embodied carbon. So I'll put all three of those together because they're kind of linked. Uh, we used the Passive House Ribbon for the embodied carbon. We used um, Therm for the thermal bridges and we used Revit and then we could we got some plugins from Lithuanian plugin person for the timber frame because they know about timber frame. Great, thank you very much. OK, and I'm conscious of time and I know there'll be some people um, needing to nip away to grab lunch before they're probably into another set of Teams calls and Zoom meetings. So, um, Mark, can we just finish with the question specifically around the overlay? There were some questions around how will it work in terms of new build and retrofit and um, how is it possible to kind of combine combine the two? Well, the, the overlay does acknowledge aspects of retrofit. Um, I, it's not to say that it's uh, all singing, all dancing, and I'm sure that it has plenty of gaps, but it, it, because you know, there's only so much you can fit onto an A3 sheet in effect. Um, but you know, we are recognising aspects of retrofit on the overlay. There's more nuance to it. I would say that, yes, by all means, the, uh, a deeper consideration of retrofit should apply. Um, but really, I'm going to point people towards the carbon light re uh, retrofit course run by the ACB, which digs into moisture and ret ret you know, retrofit carbon issues are not the big problem or the, you know, the big concern. We can address that with careful design, passive house and fit focus, perhaps. But the key thing is actually recognising that in the UK we have so much masonry build, we've got to make sure that we design to manage moisture in appropriate ways. And that's where, um, you know, taking that into full recognition, whether we're using dynamic modelling analysis, laboratory tests, all sorts of other things can come to the fore, um, but we just need to get that conversation going. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I think it's always a sign of clearly a very engaging set of presentations when the Q&A bar is still completely full. We've completely run out of time and the conversation has been so interesting. So thank you both very much. I am going to stop the Q&A there. I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to everyone, but I am again, I'm conscious of time. We do spend a lot of time sitting at, um, at our computers these days. Um, so before we close, um, just a huge thank you to our two speakers, Daniel and Mark. A big thank you to to Reba for hosting the event today, doing all the technology. It almost was incredibly smooth, just a couple of tiny hiccups. So I think that can be chalked up to a big success. Um, so just as I'm drawing things to a close, I would like to mention before I go that Reba are par partnering with Architects Declare to bring you the first ever Built Environment Summit. This is a two day conference from the 28th to the 29th of October. It's running ahead of COP26, which as we all know is the start of November. If you would like to attend, there will be a link in details of how you can um, join up uh, posted in the Q&A now, I think. Um, so hopefully you can all see that. So thank you very much and we'll we'll close the session there.